welcome back to ED Extra here on the ground or in the sky here at New York for Climate Week. Um, we are back in the Nest Climate Campus where discussions are ongoing downstairs. There's several stages, some fantastic speakers gracing those stages. I'm delighted to be joined, by, joined here by one of them in the form of Jonathan Foley, who is the Executive Director of Project Drawdown. Um, Jonathan, super excited to be speaking to you, especially given that the title of your session stands out a lot on the agenda downstairs. Uh, that's all around uh, emergency break solutions. So what is an emergency break solution and what are you going to be discussing? Well, the idea of an emergency break is these are climate solutions that are faster than a lot of climate solutions. So um, let's say we replace a coal power plant with a bunch of solar panels that every year will slowly build up some impact on the climate. But some climate solutions like stopping methane leaks or stopping deforestation, we kind of front load their impact in the first few years because those are kind of faster acting solutions. So these emergency breaks can help us kind of get back on course towards a Paris-like outcome for climate change because we've kind of fallen behind where we need to be. And the only way to catch up now is to really pull these emergency breaks. So our organization coined that phrase uh, to kind of talk about emergency breaks and did the science to figure out like what solutions would give us the fastest kind of impact on the atmosphere as well as the largest kind of impact on the atmosphere. Because it's not just the size of a climate solution, it's their speed especially when we're a race against time. Yeah, and you mentioned um, emergency break solutions and the fact that we're behind, therefore, where we need to be. It's been interesting. I've been speaking to several speakers throughout this week, and there's almost like a tale of two cities here in New York. You've got a kind of, uh, on the one hand, there's a level of optimism about the fact that uh, the solutions are there, they're, they're in front of us. Organizations increasingly and governments increasingly are realizing the direction of travel that we need to head in. But on the other hand, there's a sort of uh, a pragmatist, a sort of pragmatist view on this that's slightly pessimistic because we're behind where we need to be, as you say, and much more urgent action is needed much faster. Where do you sit on that kind of optimism? curve? Uh, probably right in the middle of that. Uh, I think there's uh, reasons to be very optimistic about climate change in the sense that all the worst case scenarios that we used to talk about 10, 20 years ago are now off the table. They're not going to happen. A five degree world, a six degree world, that's, that's not even possible now, which is very, very good news, by the way. Um, now we're probably working on the kind of where do we go below two and a half degrees and under. But 1.5 degrees is increasingly uh, difficult to imagine. So we're kind of now wrestling from the, you know, the worst outcomes are off the table, but the best possible outcomes might be slipping off the table too. And so we're going to have to find a way to kind of land as close as we can to the best outcomes. But it's not going to be easy. We're going to have to redouble our efforts and accelerate things dramatically. The good news is we have all the tools we need to do that are here. That's what Project Drawdown has shown again and again and again. And that we have the ability to do this. And by the way, it's going to be really good for us in terms of the economy and health and human well-being worldwide, equity and justice. This is the best opportunity to build a better world in history. And oh yeah, we get to stop climate change at the same time. Now we just have to pick up the pace. And that's where Drawdown comes in. So I know this is a difficult question, but given the, the enormity and the incredible work that you guys do, but if you had to summarize in kind of 30 seconds what the mission of, of Drawdown is as an initiative, uh, what is it coming into sort of the end of this year and into 2025? Well, we're the world's leading resource for climate solutions. That's all we do. We are the trusted science-based voice for climate solutions that can pinpoint what works, what do we need to do to deploy them and give that away for free to the world as a science-based map to the future. Yeah, and um, I guess at both a corporate level and a government level, I'd be interested to hear uh, what those solutions are that are going to bridge the gap between kind of ambition and action. Starting with a corporate level, what, what one or two solutions do you think really stand out or need to stand out over the next six, 12 months that you want business leaders to be focusing on? Well, I think we're starting to see some really dramatic changes in the electricity sector, of course, as solar and batteries and LED lighting and things are getting cheaper, faster. I'm very optimistic about that area. I'm optimistic about buildings. I'm optimistic about transportation. I think we have things that are in the market now and they're going to explode. And that will largely take care of itself, I think, if we keep pushing. What I'm actually very worried about though is industry, but especially the food sector. These are sectors that are very stubborn. We're actually kind of going the wrong way on food emissions. And they're often filled with a lot of greenwashing. Uh, we're not only not doing the right thing, we're distracting us from even talking about the right things to do. So that's the sector that I get the most worried about is probably the food and agriculture sector. And that's the one we're gonna have the hardest time with. 
and at a government level, I mean, we're sat on the on the precipice of, of COP 16, COP 29, so two enormous, more further big discussions that are going to be happening over the coming couple of months. What are you hoping to see at a, a sort of global policy level over the next two or three months? Well, what have we ever seen from a COP? Uh, not very much. Uh, that's not where the things really happen. It happens in markets, in technology, in communities. Those are photo ops mostly, so I don't expect a lot, and I'm usually not very disappointed. But that said, they do set the stage for global conversations. Uh, we had a big surge of conversation around some methane recently, which is very interesting, around rainforest. I think we need to focus much, much more on deforestation, much, much more on methane. I'd like to see a call for black carbon and other super pollutants, again, which are emergency break climate solutions. We need to focus on that a lot more. And of course, as I said before, a much deeper and much more clear-eyed vision about what do we do with the world's food system and how we produce food for the world, which is responsible for about a quarter to a third of all the world's emissions. That's what I hope the COP agenda will help introduce to the world and set the stage for discussion, but not real action. That doesn't happen at a COP, but it does set the table for future conversations, and that's very, very important. As do conversations like this, I guess, and it's really nice that you're here able to talk about those emergency break solutions with other business leaders. So this event, I guess, feels a lot more practical and more in-depth, perhaps, than some of the conversations at, at COP. So thank you. I'm aware that you're probably due on stage momentarily, <laughs> yeah, Jonathan. So yeah, thanks so much. Really appreciate your time. And, and thanks a lot for tuning in back home on ED Extra.